Hi everyone, continuing on with some of the exciting architecture we uh, have on our agenda. So we're going to really take a, a sharp left turn today from some of the detail and the ornament and the high level of craft um, Drama is the word that I want to use, um, but really we haven't even seen high drama yet until we get to the Baroque, which I will start to lecture on uh, Thursday of this week. Uh, but the opulence, I suppose, would be a better term to use um, that we're, st we're starting to see and we've seen in the work that we've looked at to date. Um, there's going to be a strong resistance to that starting in the 16th century and starting with the work that we are going to look at today which can broadly the book broadly clumps it under the protestant reformation which is an interesting time period in in world history uh, and certainly has architectural uh, implications but i would suggest is not only confined to the architecture of the Protestant Reformation, but at the same time, there's a divergence from the work of the classical Renaissance architects and really the architecture coming out of Papal Rome, the Holy Roman Empire, um, in England, in Germany, certainly in the Dutch uh, colonies um, and Nordic states, but those are the ones that can be considered to be clumped under the um, Protestant Reformation. Um, but aside from the, um, the sort of Protestant movement that's taking hold in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, um, the, Brit the English are doing something different than what we're seeing in papal Rome. So there's a little bit of a, uh, not a, not a backlash so much as it relates to like the work of Sir Christopher Wren and Inigo Jones that we're going to look at today, um, but really a desire to break away and to create something, something different from what really we've been doing for 200 years at this point. Um, so I want to start, I want to start with this guy. And those of you who have, um, taken world history courses before may or may not recognize the, the photograph. I don't think that I would have been able to recognize the photograph, uh, for who he is, but certainly familiar with the work that this man did. And this is Martin Luther. Uh, so Martin Luther was a, a theologian, was an academic, um, worked at the Wittenberg University. Um, and in 1517, uh, as probably many uh, or maybe all of you know, in 1517, he nailed what is come to be known as his 95 theses uh, to the door of the Wittenberg or the Wittenberg University Library, I believe it is. The Wittenberg doors are the sort of historic doors where Martin Luther uh, was said to have posted his 95 theses. His 95 theses are basically his um, opinions as to all of the problems that uh, exist with the Holy Roman Empire um, and 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 really the uh, Catholic Church. He aimed so uh, and the one of the three or four primary reasons why this is why this is relevant is that Martin Luther he attacks architecture. Um, architecture is in the crosshairs of what he's saying the problem is with the, um, with the Catholic Church. It's perhaps not his primary concern, 
Um, and he's not saying that we shouldn't build. Uh, he's certainly not saying that we shouldn't build uh, churches. And he's certainly not saying that churches shouldn't have uh, quality, uh, that there shouldn't be quality spaces and they shouldn't uh, have facility and they shouldn't have function. He's not saying any of that. What he's saying is that the indulgences has gone to unprecedented levels and it's really, really become unhealthy um, because the Catholic Church seems to be only concerned with showing off its wealth, its power, its superiority, its overwhelming vastness, um, and that shows up in the dress, in the attire, it shows up in the art that's um, populated within uh, the buildings, uh, and it certainly makes its way um, into the architecture. Um, case in point, this is Pope Leo X, these are 95 theses. Case in point is St. Peter's Basilica. Now, St. Peter's, we're going to come back to um, in probably about, well, two lectures from now, um, and is, is really the crown jewel of the Vatican and uh, probably one of the, the most important buildings uh, in the world and is a spectacular place in and of, uh, in and of its own. Um, and we'll study some of the architectural qualities of it. But really, I want to focus, keep the focus on the Protestant Reformation. And while this building that you're looking at here, which is largely the work of uh, Raphael, of Bramante, of Michelangelo, um, Bernini is, is the architect of the uh, piazza and, and sort of the wing elements, which we'll study a little bit more in depth in, in a in in a week or so's time, um, the work is not built yet in 1517 when Martin Luther is uh, launching his reform movement and his reform ideas, but certainly news of the soon-to-be St. Peter's Basilica, the grand St. Peter's Basilica, um, has made its way throughout Europe and throughout the world. And so we know that there's this large enterprise and the St. Peter's that exists there before is not, um, is not a small building uh, either. And really, this is what Martin Luther is attacking. He's saying enough with the opulence, enough with the show of how powerful the church is and how monumental the church wants uh, itself to be perceived as um, certainly leadership is is in question. Or he's criticizing leadership. He's criticizing the notion of how we worship and spirituality. And really, the, he's, he's saying the focus is not on where it should be. The focus is on an individual as a leader of the church. It's not on God, or it's not on Christ, who's in his opinion is the center of the church. Uh, and certainly we're not focusing on the individual's uh, relationship with the deity, in this case, God. He's saying oftentimes the focus is the person giving the, uh, the, the, the person speaking from the altar, uh, or even the focus is the architecture itself. So uh, he's attacking really all of the above. He's attacking the way the Catholic Church has led itself to be um, a business. Um, the indulgences, as they're known, I used the term earlier, I didn't explain really what it means, but there's a kind of a, a common practice, uh, especially with the aristocracy, especially with the, uh, the royalty of the time, that um, really their, their place in heaven can be purchased, for lack of a better term. I don't want to go uh, too deep into the sort of theology or the politics of what Luther is attacking, but uh, that's a common practice in the Catholic Church in this time frame 
that um, that you know your place in heaven can be purchased for a certain amount. You could commission a church, you can build a dome, you can give money to a certain cause, um, and um, and your place in the afterlife will be secured. W- with all of the problems that that uh, presents, uh, Martin Luther is is basically highlighting the the brokenness of the church. Um, so along with that, he's, you know, certainly uh, criticizing the architecture of the church. So what um, what he is going to start and some of the work that we're going to look at um, here today is the result of a, I would ca- describe a hyper react, hyper opposite reaction um to what's happening. Some you guys here, and I, I kind of think of, and even in, in my conversations, I describe sort of the um, the way the politics of the world seems to kind of swing from one to another, from a five year period to another five year period. I always think of ourselves as being kind of stuck in this pendulum of hard swings one way, hard swings the other way, hard swing. Um, and that's there's some truth to that because in in large part that's how um, you know we as a society uh, tend to um, tend to deal with uh, with issues. This is no different. The Protestant Reformation is seeing the pendulum swing in one direction uh, with the the sort of opulence and the um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here the corruptness of the Catholic Church. Um, and and is going to encourage um, its people and its architecture to swing the pendulum in the opposite direction. Um, so Martin Luther really starts the Protestant Reformation, which is going to have certainly implications on the architecture of Northern Europe and of um, Northwestern Europe. the the five sole I, I would be remiss if i didn't touch on the five sole because actually architects uh during the renaissance and then even during the baroque uh are actually going to use these these devices as um generators of architectural ideas in in their work or have used the sole as generators of the work and and actually as you'll see uh with bernini here coming up um, they use them as generators of ideas um, for architectural design in future work, uh, future relative to the time frame that I'm in now. I'm basically in the beginning of the 16th century. And the five sole are sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, gratia uh, solu Christus, and soli de gloria. So only through scripture, only through faith, only through grace, uh, only through Christ and only through glory um, can one have salvation. These are the five kind of sole. And and really the Protestant Reformation is, is saying, um, no, it's really through the individual's relationship with the divine is where salvation is. So, we need to start to take the focus off of a central individual figure um, who um, who really delivers uh, the message of, of divinity to us, and and that has a very direct um, architectural implication because we are going to, well, I guess fast forward 150 years, the papacy, which continues to exist. Um, spoiler alert, is going to respond to the Counter-Reformation. Um, so, so the simplicity that you're going to see here in the work today is going to have an equal and opposite re-reaction uh, by the Catholic Church. Um, but in doing so, what we're going to hear the popes of the time tell the architects like Bernini and Boromini, uh, no more central planned churches, because while they're going to punch back, there there is some level of accepting 
um, some of the brokenness of the Catholic Church. And one of them is that admonition, is that uh, the, the individual that delivers the message, whether it's the priest or the bishop or the pope, um, is a central figure. But really, we need to take the focus off the one central individual. And really, the, the, the focus needs to be given back to the deity and God and Christ as a central figure. So the popes will explicitly tell their architects no central planned churches, uh, partly for this reason. Uh, these are the Wittenberg doors. Uh, I'm not sure if they are actually... is kind of interesting if somebody wants to look this up and verify uh if what i'm my conjecture here is correct just from looking at this image it may see it may look like the the uh, theses have actually been etched uh to be sort of permanently uh part of the door that's interesting it's the first time i've noticed that i've used this slide for for well last year and this year um, but I didn't notice that it looks as though the theses actually may be inscribed or embossed into the door. So if somebody wants to look that up and, um, and, and let us know, that would be great. And these are the, basically the doors uh, upon which uh, Luther posted his 95 theses, thereby um, setting into motion the sort of Protestant Reformation. Okay, so what is the Protestant Reformation? What were its implications on uh, architecture specifically? Well, um, at a high level, it you're going to see a extreme simplification. You won't see it necessarily in this, but it's kind of, you know, I'm going to take you to a progression sort of back uh, uh, from kind of where we are, the level of detail, the level of ornamentation uh, that we're seeing in sort of the late Gothic, the medieval and the Renaissance. I'm going to take you back to kind of a, a stripping away um, of that ornamentation, of that simplicity, and get you to what I would consider the height of the Protestant Reformation, but I'm going to do it in sequence. So we're going to start with this one. Uh, this is uh, Newkirk in Amsterdam. And Newkirk, I'm, I don't speak Dutch or German Dutch, um, so I'm just going to spell the word N-I-E-U-K-I-R-K, -K, which I believe means new church, simply and, and sort of plainly. New Kirk, uh, and it's in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. This is built uh, beginning of the 15th century, 1408. And really it was built uh, as a, as a uh, church using Gothic detail. Um, but you, in the... Dutch version of, um, of of Protestant work, it is really what I should be doing is showing this side by side with a sort of a high Gothic like the uh, cathedral at Cologne so that you can see that although it may look to us today as though it is a highly ornamented um, uh, version of uh architect gothic architecture it actually is refreshingly simplified in comparison to sort of high gothic work um but it's really not even so much the inside that is um, um where evidence of what the protestant reformation uh is doing in architecture is visible it's actually on the inside um I think I actually have, yeah, I do have photos of the inside. Um, take that back. There we go. No, I don't have photos of the inside of Newkirk, Amsterdam, and that's because it's no longer used as a church. Uh, and so there really aren't photos of what the interior would have looked like at the time in the 16th century, at the time of uh, Lutheranism, Calvinism, and the sort of... Um, um, Protestant Reformation, but but the interior quality, architectural quality specifically, w had become uh, a fascination of uh, lots of Dutch painters uh, of the time. Uh, specifically, uh, the two painters that the book cites are Peter P I E T R Peter Jan Sandard San San Redam. S A E N R E D A M, Peter Van Sanredam, and Emmanuel de Witt, 
Emmanuel, E-M-A-U-N, E-M-A-N-U-E-L, D-E-W-I-T-T-E. Um, and actually the phrase I, I jotted down literally is that duck, Dutch painters took great pride in depicting the non-central focus of the church. Okay, couple really important kind of architectural things to note here. First and foremost, um, you are probably seeing already that there is uh, not a lot of color or at least not a lot of color variation in this interior view of Neukirk in Amsterdam. Uh,
prophet is, has the, the sort of wave of the, weight of the world on his shoulders, um, which is the, uh, actually the cover of an Ayn Rand uh, book. If I can actually plug um, a book uh, after you're done with this class, maybe a good uh, summer reading for those of you interested in architecture or in a career in architecture, read Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead. It's a fantastic, fantastic book. From Ayn Rand's Fountainhead, I discovered some of her other writings, and Atlas Shrugged is one of her. Uh, it's actually her, her magnum opus. Um, uh, anyway, she's a wonderful author, and, and um, it kind of takes me back to, to, uh, to the Atlas Shrugged novel. But also, I can see the whitewashing, but the whitewashing here is done with marble, which I think gives it a really uh, refreshing classical quality. Um, and the symmetry. I mean, I'm, a, I'm I actually, in my own work, I, I'm not uh, a stickler on symmetry. In fact, I celebrate asymmetry. I think asymmetry is a beautiful, beautiful thing and can lead to really interesting architectural solutions. That's not to say I don't do symmetry. Symmetry is, it, it has its uh, qualities as well. But that's just to say that it, I don't necessarily, I'm not drawn to a space because of its symmetry or its asymmetry. But here in this space in particular, um, the, the sort of symmetry has a real, I guess, a peaceful quality to it. There's a sort of calmness, I feel, um, in, in this space. Um, I think the chandeliers help. Um, I'm always intrigued by the sort of law, the, the very tall hanging chandelier. Um, if you remember the slides of Aya Sophia, the, um, actually the, uh, the, the way they hang chandeliers in, in, uh, Islamic, um, uh, it's not a church, it's an Islamic uh, temple, I suppose. Um, the way they hang the chandeliers, you know, 70, 80, 100, 120 feet down and kind of just suspend them like 8, 9, 10 feet above the ground. I'm, I've always been kind of intrigued by that um, by that juxtaposition. So I think there's a little bit of that quality here. Um, anyway, it's a World Heritage Site in Amsterdam. It's the most prominent space within the uh, Stadhuis, which is the uh, Burgersaal Hall. Um, okay, and from here, looks like we're at 53 minutes, so I'll try to uh, get through this quickly, but I can't, uh, I don't want to cut short um, the importance of Sir Christopher Wren's work, and specifically Sir Christopher Wren's work at St. Paul's Cathedral. St. Paul's Cathedral is in London. Uh, it's the, I believe, the burial site of the Apostle Paul, um, built 1680 to 1710. Uh, and one of this is why I prefaced in the beginning by kind of, you know, yes, it's all this chapter 13 as the book, uh, kind of has it all lumped together as the Protestant, as Protestant Europe. Um, yes, there's a lot going on with the, the architecture of the Protestant Reformation, but also this is not necessarily part of the Protestant Reformation, but it's happening in the same time frame. So this is England, this is London. Um, they're uh, still part of the, the uh, I suppose, the Catholic faith in a sense, um, but they are also looking to take sort of a divergent direction architecturally. Um, incidentally, also kind of a simplification in terms of color. Um, so where the, um, uh, the, the work that we saw in uh, Amsterdam is whitewashing the interior, I would describe some of the work of like Sir Christopher Wren, Indigo Jones, it, as whitewashing the exterior, actually. Um, and uh, I love this slide because this is kind of when in preparing uh, for this lecture last year is when I really discovered, and the book doesn't mention this, but to me, the, the uh, resemblance is striking of the formal quality, the classical stylistic quality of St. Paul's Cathedral um, and likening it to 
our state capitol building. I think the architects of the state capitol building were certainly looking at this work of Sir Christopher Wren at St. Paul's Cathedral uh, and taking some level of inspiration from it. That's my my conjecture, my two cents. And actually, there is a view of the state capitol. So I don't know. For me, it's really hard uh, to look at this and to look at this and to say that there isn't a comparison, whether it's the... Um, whether it's the... the it's not quite right to describe this as the tholobate, but um, probably should say the tempietto, which is a circular co colonnade uh, that really wraps a solid interior space. Um, it's hard not to not to see the comparison there. Uh, the three levels, base, I would say shaft, dome, base, shaft, dome, um, you know, the treatment relative to the ground plane, sorry, the treatment of the, uh, the, the piano nobile or the primary level of the church relative to the ground plane, uh, a lot of similarity there. Anyway, they, uh, I think the resemblance is, is hard to, uh, to look past, but beautiful work, beautiful work in both, both locations. Um, okay. This is, uh, I'm not sure. I, I think this is pronounced Greenwich. It's G R E E N W I C H Gre Greenwich. Uh, this is known as the queen's house. This is Inigo Jones, another, um, prominent um, Brit uh, English architect, 1616. Um, we didn't get, we don't get into uh, Andrea Palladio in this uh, course, but on the villas, Palladio is a prominent architect who is known for his work in designing and building beautiful classical uh, summer houses or villas uh, for the wealthy. Um, and Inigo Jones is certainly making reference to the Palladian Villa in the quality of the design of this space. Uh, very simple form, elegant but simple. Uh, and we're actually starting to see some of the sort of characteristics that we're going to see in the Baroque with the sort of curvature and the drama that's going to uh, present itself in the work that we're going to see there. And to me, this has probably my favorite space uh, which I haven't said one of my favorite spaces of all the spaces we study in this course, in the 15B course. Uh, not a space that I've seen, but I do look forward to visiting uh, at some point in my life. Uh, this is the Tulip Stairs, um, which I think is just a, a fascinating qual interior quality, um, which is on the inside of Inigo Jones' Uh, Queen's House. Open, stair that's basically open on one side, walled on the other side, uh, which allows you to kind of look down over the space and, and brings, uh, by having the open, open, open stair, uh, allows the space to just be absolutely flooded with natural light, which gives it, I think, a very interesting quality. Um, and the last of the works that we're going to look at is back to Sir Christopher Wren. Uh, and this is St. Stephen in London, 1672. And it's actually St. Stephen Walbrook, W-A-L-B-R-O-O-K, St. Stephen Walbrook. Um, Greek cross plan. You can kind of trace it there. Um, it, the... Primary character defining feature here are the eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the eight arches that define the central element, which really, I would say, brings the focus from, this is kind of a, uh, I would say, a, a major kind of shift point in, in architectural 
spatial quality where the interior starts to become, I would say, more celebrated than the exterior uh, of, of an architect's work. And Sir Christopher Wren, I think, does it masterfully in St. Stephen Walbrook. Uh, and that's something that's going to stay with us for the next couple hundred years as we work through the Baroque uh, and then even get into uh, to modern architecture. And I'll, I'll, I'll leave you guys with this. A uh, very prominent architect uh, whose work I admire tremendously. Uh, his name is Steiners. I'll, I'll kind of park on this image here. So again, this is St. Stephen Walbrook in London, 1672. Architect is Sir Christopher Wren. Uh, Stephen Hole, a, uh, an American architect whose work I admire uh, a lot, and I uh, listen to and have attended uh, his lectures when I've had the opportunity to listen to him lecture and talk about his work, describes something that he remembers hearing from one of his professors in college, you know, 40 or 50 years ago when he was in school. Um, and it was the, the idea that a building should be more when you go into it than when you look at it. A building should be more when you go into it than when you look at it. Which I think kind of captures the idea that yes, a building should be interesting to look at. It should have qualities. It should, uh, you know, be kind of well thought through and well designed from the outside. And so the facade, the exterior presence of a building, the way the form reads, from the exterior, from the street, from across the way, from the rooftop adjacent. Those things are all important. A building should, I believe, want to be looked at, uh, but it should have an even better quality when one goes into it than when one is simply looking at it. So the interior, which is really where we as human beings occupy space, we don't really occupy space on the exterior, um, really the interior is where uh, the, the, the purpose or the raison d'etre, the reason for the architecture to be built in the first place is for the interior space to shelter us from the exterior. So the interior should have a quality that's greater than or that um, uh, gives us even more sort of uh, firmness, commodity or delight than the exterior of the space exterior of a work of architecture okay so i'll leave you with that uh just over an hour i'm sorry i went a little bit long this is the first one back in a couple weeks um so thank you for your attention um watch it again if you if you need to or slow it down i'll give you guys a couple days before i post the next lecture uh and we will be starting with my favorite portion of the semester which is going to be the baroque Thank you.